Hello yet again to allprophecyfulfilled.com on the World Wide Web and of course on Facebook and on YouTube, simply All Prophecy Fulfilled. Okay, we are cruising through our ABCs, the Bible Prophecy series, uh, winding it down really, so we've only got one or two left to go here. Uh, we've looked at a, at a number of interpretive principles and uh, today we're going to look at one that uh, at least from my observation, it seems to have gone uh, largely disregarded or ignored, at least you know from the people I've spoken to, and, and I'm not really sure why. Uh, maybe they're just unaware of it, so they're not able to actually see it, I guess. And, and what I'm referring to is typology, uh, or as I like to put it, uh, putting on the typological lens. So we're talking about types and anti-types. So simply put, a type is something uh, that we see in the Old Testament uh, that prefigures or foreshadows something future to it. So we get the word type from the Greek word tupas, and it can mean figure or a form, a copy, an image, a model, or a pattern that prefigures something or somebody. So we see that word 16 times in the New Testament. For example, Romans 5.14, Paul says that Adam is a type of him who was to come referring to Christ. So we have Adam the type, Christ the anti-type, uh, then it's up to us to, to kind of figure out, well, how is Adam a type of Christ? But that's a different video. So uh, that particular word type, there's, there's other words in the Bible associated with the concept. So there's like, uh, for example, skia, uh, which is sometimes rendered shadow. There's uh, hoopadigma, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, which is translated copy or pattern. Uh, and is used in Hebrews, for example, uh, referring to the temple system, Hebrews 8, 5. Uh, they, the priest, uh, serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Okay, well, there's also words like parabole, uh, which is sometimes rendered uh, parable or, or, or symbol. And then there's uh, antipos, which means corresponding to the type. So you've got type, antitype. Antipos, so or that's the the counterpart. Uh, for example, First Peter three twenty one, Peter uh, referring to the the ark and the the flood waters in Noah's day, he says that corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the remo removal of uh, filth uh, from the flesh, but uh, an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you have the type, antitype that which corresponds to it. So. All that to say, I know it's kind of a lot of information there. A type is something that we see in the Old Testament that prefigures or foreshadows something future to it. That something can be a person, place, event, animal, uh, while the antitype is the later, greater uh, fulfillment of that person, place, event, etc. So a type points to the future antitype. The antitype is the fulfillment of the type. The Old Testament type is the picture. The New Testament antitype uh, is the real thing. The Old Testament type is the shadow. The antitype is the reality. So in the Old Testament, we see redemptive history kind of playing out uh, with real people, real places, real events. But those things served as types of future things to come, the full embodiment uh, of what the shadows were pointing to towards the antitype. Okay, so this really, it's, it's actually a, a pretty basic, simple concept, um, and one I think is easily agreed upon by scholars and commentators and all that. For example, when Paul says that Christ, our Passover lamb, uh, has been sacrificed, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we know that Jesus was not a, a literal, physical lamb. Paul is speaking typologically there. He, he's making the point that all the old covenant, old temple sacrifices were, were in fact pointing to the one final sacrifice that would actually atone for sins, the sacrifice on Christ on the cross. So those old covenant sacrifices uh, were the shadows of the one to come. And there's really no dispute here. Uh, the general flow of the, of the whole of Scripture is typologically progressive. It moves in a, a forward or maybe upward direction 
from initial ful promise uh, to fulfillment. So biblical flow in general, now catch this, this is important, moves from the, I'd say the narrow to the broad, uh, and it moves from the physical or the temporal or the natural or maybe fleshly towards the spiritual, the eternal, uh, the heavenly. Okay, so the story of redemption then, or the story of redemptive history is of an old covenant ethnically Jewish people uh, born into covenant through physical birth, right? And that progresses towards, or maybe it's transformed, I guess might be a better word, into a new covenant people of all ethnicities born into co the covenant community through spiritual birth. So the old covenant people typify the new covenant people, and this is how the New, covenant, uh, new Testament writers uh, interpreted Scripture. In fact, uh, I might even be a little bit controversial here in saying that the old covenant Israel and the, the Mosaic economy uh, was really but a means to an end. Now, the end being the end of that Mosaic covenant uh, itself for the purpose of bringing in the new covenant and the the end coming at the taking away of that system with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. So how do I know this? Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Or how do we know this? Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be aware that all our fathers were under the cloud all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Hey, by the way, there's some typology right there. I wasn't even thinking about that. The rock was Christ. So that rock typified, shadowed, prefigured, Christ, the real deal. Anyway, that wasn't my point. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were scattered in the wilderness. Okay, so uh, Paul is referring back to uh, Israel of old. As they came out of Egypt under Moses, Paul reminds his audience that uh, God was not pleased with that generation. So much that they died in the wilderness without uh, inheriting or entering into the promised land. Okay, then he says in verse 6, now this is interesting here, he says, Now these things happened uh, as examples for us, so that we should not crave evil things uh, as they also craved. Now, I'm pretty sure that when we read that, examples for us, the tendency is uh, for us to you know, simply look at that word example and surmise or assume that Paul is simply telling all Christians throughout all generations that that generation coming out of Egypt uh, serves as, as an example for all of us. You know, don't do what they did. And maybe in principle, yeah, we could pull that out. Um, however, here's the problem with that. Uh, that's actually an inaccurate and thus a misleading translation. That word, example, is actually type or tupas. And that for us is actually the personal pronoun uh, hemon. Um, and it's, it's over, I think it's used over 400 times in the New Testament, something like that. And that can just as easily, in fact, more often than not, it's actually translated of us. Rendering the verse something like this. And those things became types of us for our not passionately desiring evil things as they also did desire. Now, can you see the difference that, that makes? You see, Paul was not simply saying that that generation, the one that came out of Egypt, uh, generically serves as, as an example for all successive uh, generations uh, to you know, not complain. Although, uh, again, we can pull that out of there, that principle, if we want, uh, but that's not uh, regarding or taking into account audience relevance because Paul is saying that generation, the one that came uh, out of the bondage of Egypt, uh, was the type. And his generation in that first century, the one coming out of the bondage of the uh, Mosaic Covenant, was the anti-type. They were the fulfillment. 
So there's audience relevance to consider. And I, and I know this might burst your bubble a little bit, uh, but Paul's words here, they meant something to uh, his audience that they simply can't mean for us. Now in verse 10, listen to this. He says, now all these things happen to them as types, tupas, and have been written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Okay, whose admonition? Well, Paul is writing to the Corinthians upon their admonition. They, they in the first century. And he says, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. You see, Paul said that the end of the ages had come upon them. They had come to the, the end. They had come to the end of the Old Covenant Mosaic Age. Now, this is so important. Uh, Israel's go-to reference point, their covenantal beginnings with God as God's people and his nation, that was set at the original exodus out of Egypt when God brought them out and he made them a nation. He gave them laws, okay? So time and time again in the New Testament, uh, we see all these references and allusions back to this time period, this 40-year time period. Why? Well, this was the, the granddaddy of all reference points of teaching illustrations and thus typological illustrations. Why? Well, because the original Exodus out of Egypt was the ultimate type that was actually going on during that New Testament time. They, the first century Christians, were in the middle of an Exodus out of the bondage of the Mosaic Covenant uh, and the death and separation asso associated with that, okay? And into what? Into the life uh, and the freedom uh, of the new covenant in Christ. So how long did this uh, final exodus last? 40 years, just like that original exodus. Coincidence? Well, I don't think so. Okay, now catch this. Remember when Joshua, and you're familiar with the story, I'm sure, finally uh, was about to lead the people uh, into the Promised Land some 40 years after they had actually left Egypt. Do you remember this? What did God say to Joshua? Well, in Joshua 5, 9, he says, Today, let me say that again, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Now, wait a minute. I thought God took away their reproach or their shame or, or the scorn of their, their captivity status, if you will, the day they left Egypt. Well, no, not really. Not according to God. Not until they actually entered into the promised land. Now, sure, in a sense, and I really need to be careful with this, I think it might be fair to say that, yeah, in a sense, they were redeemed or delivered or saved, you know, when they left Egypt. Uh, but I need to be careful with that because I think it's more accurate to say that the process had begun at the actual Exodus. And in fact, according to God, the ultimate freedom in the land, their ultimate redemption from slavery and their complete salvation uh, was not realized until that day when he said today, some 40 years later. Wow. Now, you know what this reminds me of? Uh, Jesus, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> Jesus speaking to his disciples, they had asked him about, he told them the temple was going to be coming down and they said, well, when are these things going to be and all that. And you know, you know, this, you know, the chapter, chapter 21, Mark 13, Matthew 24. And he tells them or he describes the events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple that would occur within their lifetime. And he says in Luke 21, 28, he says, but when these things begin to take place, Straighten up, <laughs> lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Now, did you catch that? Jesus told them that when they saw the events unfolding, such as the Roman already surrounding the cities, to pay attention, because that would be when their redemption or their deliverance would be close at hand. But wait, you say again, <laughs> uh, weren't they already redeemed or delivered or bought back at, at Christ's uh, death on the cross? Uh, 
Well, according to Jesus, while his work on the cross uh, completed his ministry, his work on earth, redemption in its fullest sense uh, had not been fully accomplished. Not until that mosaic system was finally taken out of the way. There was a transition period uh, between covenants. And guess what? It lasted 40 years. Imagine that. Okay, now remember what I said about the typological progression of Scripture. Biblical flow uh, moves from the uh, physical, temporal, earthly, natural, if you will, to the spiritual, eternal, heavenly. So it, this is important to keep in mind because we need to keep in mind that a, a, an earthly physical kingdom ruled by an earthly physical king sitting on an earthly physical throne, ruling over an earthly physical people, uh, along with all the earthly physical temporal ordinances associated, associated with the, you know, the washings and the rituals and, and whatnot, um, those were not sufficient to actually uh, bring about the restoration of all things. Those were not sufficient to actually bring life to the dead. The flesh could not produce what, what the spirit could, or I'd say the covenant of the flesh could not produce what the covenant of the spirit could. Uh, sometimes flesh and spirit are used as contrasting terms of contrasting the old and the new covenants. Now, again, those things were only a shadow. They could only represent typologically the substance of what was about to come. When I say about to come, I see, I, I mean soon, near. How do I know that? Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Paul writes this, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon uh, or a, a Sabbath day, things which were merely a shadow of what is about to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now that about to come, that's the word mellow, and you probably don't see it in your particular translation, but it's there in the Greek, and it means about to, imminent, soon, it's impending, it's right on the cusp of happening. So too in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. He, uh, the Hebrews writer says, For the law, since it, it is only a shadow of the good things about to come, and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices uh, uh, with which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Here's the point I'm really trying to, to get at. and it, I'm talking about timing or typological timing. It seems like it always comes down to timing with me, doesn't it? The 40-year time period uh, that, that transpired to bring about the transition of covenants is yet another interpretive tool uh, that viewed through the typological lens demonstrates the timing of the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies clearly coming into fruition in the New Testament. So let me put it to you this way. Uh, the, the Old Testament provides picture after picture of the process of complete salvation through types. So uh, when we get around to the New Testament, we see the same typological progression or, or pattern maybe uh, uh, playing out. Only this time it's the antitype, it's the fulfillment. So it doesn't just keep going thousands and thousands of years, God completed it, it's fulfilled. And folks, we cannot uh, have completed salvation without the coming of Christ to complete that salvation process that ultimately takes away, well, man's reproach, if you will, as, as in with, with Joshua. Remember that? Uh, so 1 Peter chapter 1, take a look at this. Peter speaks, to, uh, speaks of an inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, reserved in heaven for you, who through faith are protected by God's power for the salvation that is ready to be revealed. When? In the last Time. That salvation was about to come in their day. Hebrews 9.28 So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time without sin to those who are eagerly waiting for him. For what? For salvation. Here's what I'm really getting at. If the type is consistent with the antitype, 
if the 40-year exodus out of Egypt is consistent with the 40-year exodus out of the Mosaic Covenant, if the old covenant sacrificial, sacrificial system, the, the type and pattern representing redemption, is consistent uh, with the anti-type, the actual redemptive work of Christ, then Christ appeared a second time. He came just as he promised to his disciples within that generation and brought complete salvation with him. This is what typology, putting on a type, typological lens, this is what allows us to step back and see, because Scripture demonstrates. You know what? Um, I've got more to say on typology, so we're going to make the next one a part two. We're going to call this part one. I know that was an awful lot, but I've still got some important things I want to say about typology, because it's so important. Okay, so uh, that's it for now. Hey, thanks for joining, joining me. I know that was kind of long-winded. Go back, play it over, open up your Bible, take a look at it, and uh, comments, questions, welcome. We'll see you on the next go-around. Bye-bye.